It's more than just a job. The draft! It's mandatory! A new universe, bookshelf format, special edition by Grunwald, Nasazia, Trimpy, Jansen, Baker. On sale in April from Marvel. TM 1988 Marvel Entertainment Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast, Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. This, I uh, think this is the beginning of a beautiful random banter. Random banter time, buddy! That was a terrible Bogart impersonation. Play it, Sam. Play it like you used to. <laughs> hey, uh, you still got dollar well drinks on uh tuesdays i think that's another famous line I am from that shocked shocked that there's gambling going on in this establishment <laughs> here's your winning sir thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's a fabulous movie yeah it's a great movie it has been quite a long time since i've seen casablanca it's been a while since i've seen it as well there's a lot of those classics where it's like you know it's like a uh, uh riverboat on the african queen i love that movie yeah. and i probably have not seen that in 30 years yeah i probably haven't seen that as long as it's been since i've read power pack to be honest kind of thing <laughs> no, i i agree i uh actually random banter tomorrow night i'm going to be doing a podcast with ryan daly on the fire and water records mm. and we are going to be talking about soundtracks mm -hmm. and i heard the first one that he did with sean from secret wars and beyond podcast sean ross and i was like oh Oh, I'm not even done listening to this, and I'm already writing out the sound the the songs I want yeah. on my movie soundtrack. But the one of them, one of the ones that he chose was from Go. I've never seen that. I own a VHS copy of it, and I was like, it's been forever since I've seen it. I want to watch this again. My wife can get through the movie with me. She goes, it's <laughs> too intense, and I'm like, it's a dark comedy, and it's great. <laughs> never heard of it. Never have. Yeah, never even heard of it. So. That's, totally clueless. It's pretty good. I, I liked it. Anyways, um, a couple of things before I get to other random matches that I was really going to talk about. Mm -hmm. There is a new format to the Power Pack comic book for a few months. Uh, the new format, more story, fewer ads, better printing. That's per the cover. But this also means that there's pretty much just house ads for advertisements. So we're going to be doing more of those and less the dated product placements for a while. Yeah, they just stuff them in the back of the book basically yeah. as well. So we're going to be kind of playing with that a little bit, but we'll get back to doing advertisements when we get more. Beyond that, uh, it was my birthday weekend mm. this last weekend, mm -hmm. and uh, I went up to Redmond, Washington area. Kirk Actually, I guess it was Kirkland area, but went up there and saw an old friend of mine, Kapil. He's a guy I used to work with he, on a project. Um, he's from India. And him and his wife live up there now. It's been about five years since I've seen him. Wife and I went up there. He's got two daughters. My daughter got along well with his kids. Uh, they were playing the entire time. Uh, his wife and a bunch of their friends all from India all kind of came over and congregated. And it was kind of picking up the same conversation we had five years ago. And it was a ball. Yeah, it, 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 just kind of a weird birthday weekend. And we didn't go up there for my birthday weekend. It just... This was going to fit in time-wise. I didn't think of any, you know, anything else I was going to be doing for my birthday weekend. So, yeah, sure, let's do it. And it just was a nice way to spend my birthday. That's really great. No, it's kind of nice when you can, uh, you know, just you, you reconnect with friends that you haven't seen in forever. And it's just like, oh, so anyway, like we were talking about, you know, 10, 20, 15, 5, 1, whatever number of years. Right. And you just like go, hey, so let's talk about that thing that we were talking about yeah. last time. Yeah, you just it's really great to have friends that you can just slip into those kind of comfortable shoes with, those comfortable shoe friends. Yeah, and it, and it was fun. Just I love that group because it's they'll go through their own phase of uh, the way they talk amongst themselves and each other, mm -hmm. where it's a little bit of English, it's a little bit of Hindi, and it's a little bit of whatever other dialect that they... They live from... Mm -hmm. like, Kapil knows six languages. Okay. And it's... Most of them are dialects from yes. India. And so he will slip... Him and his friends will slip comfortably out of those different dialects. And he had to keep saying, English, English only, yeah, English yeah. only. <laughs> but they, 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 I, they're just such a great group of people. Uh, very friendly. Um, the food is fantastic. Uh, we were just 
just sitting around the house and like one of their friends was just utilizing the kitchen making bombay sandwiches for everybody that were just tasty as anything nice um, yeah just a lot of fun a well, lot of fun good i'm glad that you had a really good weekend and i'm kind of jealous of the food because you were describing everything that i like to eat yeah. yeah i'm not a picky eater but man i got like on soundtracks i have opinions on food and i like <laughs> soundtracks and i like food <laughs> and if uh, basil politeris's conan the barbarian soundtrack wasn't on there then well jed i don't even know you Mm, nice very yeah, nice very nice go. very nice also transformers uh the movie yep. soundtrack's pretty great and so is uh basically a highlander soundtrack you could just be like my pick is highlander yeah uh yeah listen to what i chose for my soundtrack choice yeah <laughs> um how about you what's your random banter Oh, my random banter is that uh, last weekend we went up to Leavenworth with some friends for uh, a nice long weekend and uh, to celebrate their winter ice festival. Nice. Yep. So uh, near the end of January, they just continue Christmas. It's really kind of fun. You know, Leavenworth, <laughs> Washington is this uh, little faux German town up in the mountains. Uh -huh. And it's it's not a big place, but it's it's pretty it's kind of a shopping destination you know it's just like every other store is a wine shop and i'm like yeah, i'm not really into shopping but they do have really good food and we found this uh awesome cellar restaurant that had german food and i had the uh the schnitzel cordon bleu and it's uh -huh. just <laughs> i won dinner is what it boiled down to but they had an accordion player there who was from Germany, named Franzel, and we, bef you know, we befriended him because we got my daughter, and she's all like dancing to his music and everything. So he's coming over and talking to us, and we liked it so much that uh, the next day when our friends arrived, uh, you know, that they were staying with us, we just took him right back there because yep. Franzel was playing between X and X and X and X, and so we're like, we got to go back during his, you know, during his set, and he's, you know, and the day before he was like, come in, make reservations as soon as they open ask for this table tell them the musician told you, you know? so it was, it was really nice it was a uh, we got up there parked the car and that night it snowed like four to eight inches and we didn't move the car for four days so by nice. the time you know when we were going to leave everything had melted off the roads were amazing we had a great drive out you know it was like on a monday now so it was cool on the way up we stopped at mary hill got a stonehenge saw that uh, yeah i put the pictures up. i'm trying to put pictures up and i'm kind of like i need to <laughs> that's what threw me off the other day is because you put that yeah, picture up yeah. and i was like are we still recording? Yeah, we're recording. Yeah, I know. It's from a week ago where it's just like, yeah, so no, we just had a really great time. We snowshoed. We ate really good food. We visited with friends. Our friends got, uh, you know, high school age daughters who love my kiddo, which is awesome because they're just like, yeah, we're playing mm -hmm. with Aurora all this time. So that was really cool. Uh, we introduced them to snowshoeing. We took, they hadn't been up to Leavenworth before. They had all these competitions going on where the Nikki's daughters were just crushing. So it's just like, oh, they're doing like a mug relay. Okay. The girls won that. Okay. They're doing a, uh, like hacky sack carry on their feet. The girls crushed that. <laughs> okay. So they just kept on taking like first place, first nice. place. They're very athletic girls. And it was just, it was it was a fun time. And it was also, uh, oh, what was really cool is the last night that we were there, they were having fire dancers in the main square, except they had little technical issues. So their set got delayed mm -hmm. uh, by whatever X amount of time. But because of that, they drifted into the fireworks display. So where we were standing was fire dancers, you know, 10 feet in front of us, firework display behind them. It's like. Yeah, it's a pretty cool way to That's spend a day. not a bad <laughs> way to do it, no. Yeah. So it was just a lot of fun. We did sledding. We played in the snow. They have Christmas lights up everywhere. It was uh, just super beautiful. So it was a great great trip to get out of town and just spend time with friends and just kind of decompress a bit and chill. So Looks like oh, that was the order of the day. Yep. Get out of town, spend time with friends exactly. in northern Washington. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> So that's what I've been doing. So there's my banter and of random. That means that uh, we need to move on with the two cents replay from last episode. Mm -hmm. Well, let me get right to that. Grandpa's birthday is just around the corner, so the powers are prepared to party and present him with a nostalgia-driven present that Julie has been handmaking in her home ec class over the last two months, i.e. a stuffed sheep that harkens the mind back to the sheep farm that Grandpa grew up on. Well, this present is promptly stolen by three mean girls who have been shaking down the neighborhood's young girls for toys and dollars because it makes them feel powerful and because they are villains of the one-note variety that need to be put into a timeout by the one, the only, Power Pack. Now that the three poorly dressed desperados are no match for the fashion-forward family of four, two-sentence replay is over, why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our Power Pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend. I need to start off by saying that the name of this issue is Lights, Camera, Action, because that will help explain my choice. 
I'd like to present you with... <laughs> That's awesome! Cult Classic IPA by Ex Nova Brewing Company. Hollywood Movie Madness. Cult Classic Pale Ale. Oh, this is great. This is a uh, green and black cast with a little bit of white lettering on it. You know, label. And you go around it and it is, it's looking like it is the carpeting from The Shining. Yeah. It is the leg lamp from A Christmas Story, which yeah. is an all-time favorite. There is a bowling ball, which I'm going to say represents, oh, let's just say the dude uh, in uh, you know, the, big the Big Lebowski. Mm, eh, okay. Uh, there's a TV with a bunch of static in it. Maybe that's Poltergeist. Poltergeist. It's got, oh, it's got a Maltese Falcon on the top. Hey, that blended in nicely into my uh, random banter intro. And it's got a uh, front-loading VCR with some, uh, you know, tapes next to it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just watching movies on the movie right. Madness. And then it's got the uh, Audrey plant, Audrey 2, over yeah. in a corner underneath a uh, silhouette of Alfred Hitchcock. That is pretty swell. I don't know about the... Uh, the wallpaper, what that might be reminiscent of, it's probably still The Shining. But uh, no, that's cool. Also, over in Portland is a video rental shop called Movie Madness, which is amazing. Yes. It's like, it, you know, you might be thinking, hey, it's streaming now, baby. I can get whatever I want. Movie Madness has the stuff you can't get anywhere else. Forget your Hulu and your Fire Stick and your uh -huh. Kindle and your, I don't know, what Thrumble and you, Net most of the stuff that is, and <laughs> Yeah, most of the stuff that is really hard to find, really, like, obscure, you can go there and find it. Not to mention that it is also a curated museum yeah. that has a lot of movie props yep. in it. Yeah. And it, it, it has been years since I've been in there, but I you can walk through there and just see some fantastic, fantastic stuff from a lot of different you know classic movies. Yeah, thus the all of the kind of hints there. But is there is... even any story time on that? Let's let me give that a look real <laughs> quick. Uh, da -da -da -da. Movie Madness opened in 1991, and more than 25 years later, this Portland institution is still going strong. Now owned by the nonprofit Hollywood Theater, Movie Madness houses a world-class collection of 80,000-plus titles for rent, from Blu-ray new releases to cult VHS rarities. Ex Nova is proud to celebrate this true Portland classic, MovieMadness.org. So, okay, yeah, cool. I was it? just thinking it was just the generic, oh, Movie Madness, but no, it actually is. Okay, that's cool. And uh, Movie Madness Pale Ale is a classic American pale ale brewed with two row and caramel malts and Cascade Centennial and Chinook hops, offering notes of tangerine, pine, and toasty malts. The bottle's label design, created by Portland artist Nate Ashley, is a celebration of cinema, incorporating references from film icons ranging from Hitchcock to Lebowski. So, yeah. Uh, we have our Golden Cloudy IPA Normal. Yeah, it smells like a, a mild IPA. Yeah, it's That's a, actually got a pleasant flavor to it, just uh, aroma-wise. It's got a lot of foam no matter how we pour it. Yeah, I, I tilted the glass pretty aggressively, and it, it's just like... That is, uh, it's got some sediments in it. It's, gosh, that is a bubbly bubbler. And I'm watching some sediments dance around in that. That's kind of a, uh, like an almost opaque, quasi-translucent. No, okay, it's translucent. Yeah, very nice amber color, kind of like a honey. Really kind of a sweet IPA head uh, aroma to it. it smells yeah. pretty nice. Taste-wise is... It's actually very mild. That is a mild... Hmm. It's a very mild IPA flavor up front. It goes a bit kind of dusty. A little which bit. would go with an old VHS yeah. tape kind yes, of, it would. Uh, yes, kind it of would. theme. <laughs> So, huh. That's no, I, I actually kind of enjoy it. It's it's not too bad. It's not hitting that really, you know, strong metallic hits on it at no. all. That no, is I really, it is w going into kind of a weird old musty flavor pretty quickly and kind of hanging there on the tongue. It actually kind of adds like a. Well, you're also, you're also <clears throat> drinking right from the bottom. Oh, yeah. You might want to check from the drink itself. I, I yeah. kind of am sipping by the foam a little bit. I think you might be pleasantly surprised there. Okay, because it's kind of putting like a uh, like a grippy texture mm -hmm. on my tongue. It's mild. Yeah. Okay, and I think going from the bottle is uh, giving me that tongue texture because yeah. this is a uh, this is a little because I'm like this is a little bit different than what. Yeah. Huh. Okay. This is a very very mild IPA. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a summer drink beer. I would yeah, think. Yeah, I would yeah, say so. Mm -hmm. This would be a nice one to sit down and watch a movie with. <laughs> 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 you almost got laugh money out of me, man. I always think I, I always say a spit take is laugh money. It's the worst money you can ever receive because I've been I've been uh, laugh moneyed all over when I, when I've gotten people you know mid drink. I, I almost got you there. It almost, was it was it was an good. effort to keep it in. So yeah. I, I will I will take that. <laughs> no, that was good. No, I I. I 
I've been holding on to this one for a while, and I am completely doing the matching up with this just for the name of Lights, Camera, Action. No, it makes sense. I saw this a long time ago, and I wanted to bring it in somehow. So that's how I did it. So now that we have our lovely, lovely little IPA, and um, we can see that it's matching up the name, and not much else in this book, <laughs> but the name of the book at least. Well, well no, there is actually Lights, Cameras, and Action. There is this. Lights, Camera, and Action yeah. here, but it's not anything really to do with movies. No. I just really wanted to use this beer because I think it looked cool. I <laughs> know, uh, that is a great beer. And also a very big shout out to, uh, you know, Movie Madness. Enough of that. Let's move on to the opening credits of this film that we are going to be reading. Hey, hey, see what I did there? I did see. And uh, we can only do that if you give us the opening credits. Power Pack, issue number 39, August 1988. Lights, camera, action. Credits. Wrote with flair, Luis Simonson. Penciled with care, Sal Valuto. Inked on a dare, Mark Farmer. Lettered with a prayer, Joe Rosen. Colored in her lair, Glennis Oliver. Editor beware, Carl Potts. Red with a glare, Tom DeFalco. Featuring Power Pack, Alex Power, a.k.a. Destroyer. Energy Lad. Julie Power, a.k.a. Molecula, Mistress of Density. Density Lass. Jack Power, a.k.a. Counterweight. Gravity Boy. Katie Power, a.k.a. Starstreak. Light Girl! And guest starring Rebecca Littlehale, the young mutant who Power Pack once saved, and Jim and Maggie Power, the parents of Power Pack who still don't know that they have powers. It is a school day morning, which means bowls of oatmeal, backpacks, and goo games on the TV. Hooray! Well, to be honest, not a total hooray, as Katie is disturbed by oatmeal and isn't down with the glopness, so she wants Alex to disintegrate it. Jeez, just get a dog! Or wait, I have an in-canon idea. Feed it to Yoda the hamster! No can do, friend of Renu, because Yoda is sleeping in their cage in a dark, unobserved corner of the apartment and cannot be disturbed right now. So, like the powers, let's stop mentioning Yoda from here on out forever! But this does bring the conversation back around to the kids' favorite argument. Should we tell our parents about our porridge pulverizing powers? This is interrupted by Maggie entering the room to see if there has been a weather report on the TV yet, as she is getting ready to leave the apartment. Instead of the weather, the news comes on with a report about Rebecca Littlehale. You know, the incorrectly named Littlest Mutant from the previous issue. Of course, the kids, having maxed out their level in subterfuge, do not react to this news at all. What are you talking about? These kids have the worst p -p 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 poker faces in the world. Luckily, Ma Power is too busy packing up her artwork to notice. The reporter and Rebecca give a nice little recap of her rescue, especially the part about her being rescued by a magical flock of children. Hey, it could have been a magical flock of seagulls. No, don't, don't, just, just don't. And we watch, we watch the morning news. And we watch a girl that has the blues. Because she could pour it away. Okay, well, that kind of upset me. And Maggie is also a bit upset about the news media exploiting the girl. And has some thoughts on the magic kids. This gets into another discussion about her thoughts about kids having powers. And we find out that she does know about Frank's precog abilities. But she does not have time to talk about it now because she has a precognition that her boss will have hysterical attack if she is late. That is the cue for Alex to disintegrate his oatmeal in front of a pouty Katie and for Jack to do a zero-G flip, which he lands moments before their mom comes back in to remind them to scrape their plates before they load the dishwasher. Slam! Now all the kids start using their powers, mainly for the reason of showing the reader that this is a superhero comic, but it is also to give them something to do until the next plot point of the script arrives. Ring! And right on cue, the phone starts ringing. Remember, the kids have gotten a cryptic phone call from a threatening creep. Who wants to box their windows? Stop it. No, this guy knows who they are and has threatened to expose their powers to their parents. Another wacky racer's race to the phone is dealt with in two panels, and Julie is the winner. To celebrate, she takes a victory lap that consists of not answering the phone and not letting anyone else answer it either. Keep the phone from your sister, oh Julie of power, oh Julie of power, yo. Keep the phone from your brothers, oh Julie of power. What is wrong with you? We're doing a podcast, not a parody station. 
Okay. After a lengthy discussion of who it might be on the other end of the ringing phone, and strategies to follow if it is our mysterious caller, Julie finally answers the phone. And? And what? Well, uh, who is it? Oh, oh, oh. Well, it is their mysterious, threatening caller, and they tell Power Pack that they know that the power saved Rebecca Littlehale, and that they better stay away from her, or else... Or else what? Or else the stranger will wash Rebecca's windows. Ugh. The kids are still discussing how they are going to handle their secret stalker as they head to school. Well, at least until Jack changes the subject. Oh, Alex, I do declare, we happen to be sharing this humble sidewalk with the incredibly perfect Allison McCourt. The older sibling runs ahead to his girlfriend and her two friends and offers to carry her books. This causes a bit of mocking by the unnamed friends, but the liberated Allison says that if Alex wants to carry the books, he can. Then the unnamed friends start to exposition on their opinions about mutants, and the recent attack by Apocalypse and his horsemen, and how cute Iceman is. All while Julie and Jack are mock copying Alex carrying Allison's bag, while Katie is pretending to gag. I say, beautiful one, may I have the honor of carrying those incredible books? Oh, thank you, my lord. I wouldn't want to injure my perfect arms. Oh, puff, puff. It's nothing. Puff, gack. Hmm, Dopey Bratz. Why do I have to have Dopey Bratz relatives? Ring, ring. As the kids run off to class, Jack and Julie state that they are still worried about Rebecca in spite of the warning to stay away from her. In fact, they are so worried about Rebecca's welfare that six hours later, they decide that they are going to force Alex to go to her house to investigate instead of hanging around with Allison. All right, you say force Alex. Now, how exactly do they do that? Well, Rick, I'm glad you asked. With Jack secretly zero g his brother as he pushes, the three younger siblings make up a wackadoodle story about Alex having to go to a dentist appointment and being afraid of it. They then bring up Alex's pretend psychiatrist to really sell the tale. Wait, wait, wait. Alex has a pretend psychiatrist? Yeah, of course he does. Don't you? Oh, wait. Yeah, okay. My pretend psychiatrist is telling me not to talk to you about this. Wait, what? With an angry and aggrieved Alex orally assaulting the others, they all arrive in an alley, alter their attire, and alight into the air. Alex is arguing that he has math plans with Allison, but Julie is worried that the or else that they were threatened with will happen to Rebecca. Meanwhile, across town, home of the fighting, protesting, and counter protesting protesters. Holy aggravated protesters, Jeff Man! I know, little buddy. It is a sad, sad sight to see two angry mobs of people spewing hate on a citizen's lawn. This poor little Hale family cannot even make it to their front door without a police escort. And if the pro and anti-pro mutant protesters were not enough, there is also a gaggle of reporters. Oh no! One of the reporters has just totally, super accidentally, gently charged up and bumped slash punched into Rebecca's face, knocking off her sunglasses and spinning her around with this completely unintended contact. I think she did that on purpose. We have to help her, Jeff, man. Hold on there, little buddy. We can't get involved. We are only the impartial narrators of the story, not the partial superheroes. Others can and must be the ones to take care of this injustice. And look, her mom is taking her complaint of assault and child endangerment to the local constabulary. But Rebecca is crying because she cannot find her glasses, which are right at her feet. Velma Dinkley style. But look, up in the sky, it is a bird, a plane, a cloud with a rainbow jutting out of it. Oh, Power Pack is here. So we can drop the DC banter and get back to this comic. That reporter lady did it on purpose. She wanted Rebecca's glasses to break. Uh-oh. The young flyer is the fast and the furious. She is ready to open a new page in her war journal and rain some serious vengeance down onto the head of the morally deficient news reporter. Luckily, the rest of the kids hold her back from attacking, pointing out that their secret identities would not be so secret with all of the cameras below. And as they try to come up with a safe plan to help rescue Rebecca, Boom! the house gets firebombed. Now we have some serious chaos. People are running all over the place while Rebecca and her parents are picking themselves up from the ground. But wait! What is that sound? Yep, yep. Oh, oh no, Skippy. Skippy. Yeah, Rebecca's dog is still trapped in the house, and consequences be darned. Rebecca will save him. Keeping her eyes focused low, she navigates towards the trapped puppy. Power Pack sees this and are still flummoxed by how they can help with all of the reporters around. Jack brings up an amazing point. Why the heck didn't we ever make masks? Well, we really do not have the time to get into that right now. 
There's a burning house we have to deal with. The boys are dropped off on the ground and costume off while the girls try to stay in the smoke while they keep an eye out for Rebecca. Julie is able to cloud through the fire and find somebody in trouble. She points Katie towards the victim, saying to get a good breath because of all the smoke. Katie fills up her little lungs, flies over, and promptly lets the breath out to ask Jack, what's he doing here? They're moving the van! If it catches fire, its gas tank could explode. Get the lady, okay? While Katie starts to cough, she drags the unconscious lady to safety. Jack, meanwhile, heads deeper into the smoke to find two opposing protesters fighting. Fighting! In a fire! I mean, there is a time and there's a place for such activities, people. But when you're literally wreathed in flames, no, no, that is not one of them. Jack deals with these two by giving the guy a zero-G push into the woman, rolling them both out of the fire. This, of course, resolves with the lady on the guy's lap and her calling him a pervert. <sighs> people. She was the one with the sign saying mutants are sinners, so I'm going to judge her a little bit harsher than the pro-mutant man that got caught up in the Three's Company scenario. Katie is still pulling people out of the... Danger zone! Lana! 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 What? Danger zone. While Julie is trying to kick in the locked front door of the house to get to the trap pup inside. Alex, who earlier disintegrated the Mutants Are Sinners sign, gives her an assist in the form of a Powerball-shaped spare key. Wham! Shrek! The two run inside and retrieve the trap puppy, and then run out of the burning house. In the smoky front yard, they finally run into Rebecca. And by that, I mean that Rebecca, who has apparently been running in circles in the front yard this entire time, runs into Julie with all the force of a reporter accidentally bumping into a kid. Rebecca recognizes Julie's voice as one of the magic kids who saved her, and she is then overjoyed to be reunited with Skippy. In fact, she is so happy that she opens her eyes up to look at her rescued pup. No, 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 no. She has been doing so well. The worry here is that she will see the house fire and teleport into peril. But luckily for her, there is a brighter light than the fire to teleport to. Hearing a mighty... crack She looks up and sees two bright lights that are shining in the sky, and she teleports away with Skippy. Zapped! Jack quickly surmises that this was no ordinary, everyday run-of-the-mill hovering light in the sky, but that this was done on purpose. And boy, is he right. As Rebecca appears in midair, there are some hovering hands holding a special plastic bag just under her position, and she falls right in. Thump! Whoosh! Nothing but net! Dude, kidnapped girl. Sorry. Hate the player, not the game. Did I use that right? I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? A familiarly armor-clad figure in a jetpack is holding this plastic bag, explaining that his strobe lights brought her up and that now she is captured in a gas-permeable, power-canceling, darkened envelope. Her and her little dog Skippy, too! <laughs> he also explains that he has been hired by the right, and that he is capturing mutants for the organization for both fun and profit. Okay, uh, who or what is the right? Well, Jeff, I'm glad you asked. They are an evil organization of humans who believe that all mutants are evil. This secret organization was started by a guy named Cameron Hodge, an old friend of Angel and an antagonist of X-Factor. He is a... What's the word? Jerk? That is, in fact, a word. And okay, that's good to know. Off the Christmas list, then. And now we know that this very, very familiar-looking villain wants to sell her off. But what about the pack? Well, they are on the ground, reorganizing, powering up, and costuming on before screaming up after the flying and fleeing felon. Alex shoots a powerball, hoping to trigger Rebecca's powers, but you know what? No luck. He doesn't know about the power-canceling bag. Well, he should have been paying attention. Plan B is now in action. Julie is clouding the kidnapper, and Katie is pouring on the speed, pushing the degrabbed Alex and Jack towards the bad guy. But just before Alex touches his boot, the bad guy switches into a higher gear and moves away. Now that they are closer, the kids can see who this is. It is their arch nemesis, who is not an alien. The one, the only, the boogeyman. That's right. Their dad's old boss, who tried kidnapping the kids before, is back. He has been the mysterious caller. He has been the one warning them to stay away. So now the kids are trying to talk him into handing Rebecca back over. Because, you know, that should work. And guess what? It doesn't. You see, this is a lucrative business opportunity for him. He's got an employer who has updated his equipment, including adding in some higher altitude breathing equipment, and, uh, 
He's planning to sell them to somebody. He has been leading the kids higher up into the atmosphere. So high, in fact, that the kids can't breathe and have to call off the pursuit. Carmody gets away, and the kids have to get home and deal with their house fire smoke-laden clothes. Later that night, the family is having a moody dinner. All of the kids are bummed by failing to save Rebecca. But before the parents can really pry into whether they are not finishing their pizza, the phone rings. Dun, dun, dun. Ring, ring. Julie tells her mom to stay sat. Her words, not mine, and rushes up to get the phone, fearing the worst. But it is just Jenny wanting to know what their homework assignment was. Phew, you know, that had me worried for a little bit there. Glad it was just a regular phone call and nothing perilous. Then the doorbell rings. Ding dong! Now the kids, who have paid for the whole seat but have only been using the edge, rush to answer it. An envelope slides under the door, and Alex picks it up in such a way that all of the pictures inside fall out. Now, you may be thinking and hoping that they are all J. Jonah Jameson's collection of Spider-Man photos. But no, sadly they are not. Peter Parker did not swing by to give these cool kids a cool surprise. They also are not photographs of fairies or unicorns. No, no, those are mythical creatures. And they are not photos of people slipping on banana peels, because that would be funny. These are pictures of the kids using their powers. Katie whispers a warning, and Alex quickly tries to disintegrate them all. And he nearly gets away with it. His dad rounds the corner and spies one last photo and a note. Asking, what's this, as he picks it up, Alex mumbles that somebody slipped in under the door. The note, made with the classic cutout newspaper letters, asks the age-old questions, do you know what your children are? And the picture shows Alex and Jack, in their normal street clothes, standing on the ledge outside of their window. Jim is angry. And with good reason. While he may not like anonymous notes, he really does not like that his sons have been hanging onto a window hundreds of feet above the ground. They are sent to their room and grounded. Again. And as the four kids head towards their rooms, they admit that it could have been much, much worse. If their dad had seen any of the more compromising pictures showing them using their powers or in their costumes. But as it is, they have no idea how to find Rebecca. And they have even less time to do it. So grounded or not, they have to go out and hunt their old foe, the Boogeyman. And with Quarry like him, they are going to need help. Well, good news. Because next issue, they will be fighting Fire with Fire, co-starring the New Mutants. Don't miss it. Drop me a beat and let me tell you my rap about packaging of the Power Pack packaging. Like we mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is kind of a new format that we've got here, and we've got like a new paper. It's a much better paper on the inside, and it's kind of a much more dynamic thing on the outside. I, there's just something kind of new and fresh and kind of different about the whole book entirely. Uh, it just it, it feels a little bit different than what we see in the past. A yeah. lot of it has to do with the paper. It is crisper. The colors hold a lot more vibrancy, and it is not, you know... Yeah. That is like a it's it's a it's a thin it's a thin paper, but it's not like the rag newspaper stock that they were using right. before. Where you know it's like this paper is very much like yeah, this will hold form, and the other stuff is like don't get it wet. Yeah, don't yeah. sneeze on it, don't handle it too much because it might just start shredding and bleeding everywhere. This is yeah, this is very boom. Yeah, it, it, it looks entirely different, and, and and that even continues out to the outside of the book as well too, because we've got the outside of the book. Uh, it's better, just more vibrant color on the outside, and we've got the boogeyman Carmody. He's in his you know boogeyman uh, costume here. Well, it's a variation of it's it's, a, a it's, it's an updated yeah. color scheme, updated uh, yeah, outfit. You can't really see his face. Yeah. I mean, he's he's completely covered. It's all brown. And the uh, boy got svelte. Yeah, he's he's got lights that are shining out, and like he's heading straight towards Jack, who's who's floating in the air. He's got this wrapped up plastic bag with uh, Rebecca and her dog in it. You can kind of just barely see them through there, and then you see the rest of Power Pack coming flying in. You know, Katie's flying, holding on to a powered up Alex, and Julie's all clouded up behind. I like this cover. It's it, it's, yeah. it's a very good cover. It's yeah, this doesn't exactly happen. I mean, it comes close to this, but. It's very cool. It's very action packed. It's you know what's happening. Yes, yeah, you get the idea. And it is it is ve- when they introduce them, it's kind of cool because they don't immediately say it's Carmody. They don't sure, immediately yeah. say, "Oh, it's the boogeyman." They're kind of like, "This guy looks familiar." And they're like, "Yeah, kind of like old Carmody, but that well, can't be him." And we haven't seen him since issue 17. Something like that. So yeah, it's, it's it's been a little while. Yeah, it's uh, 16 or 17. It's it's been a while. It's mm-hmm. been a minute. Um I should have had that on Top of my head, but I don't. Um, <laughs> I looked it up the other day, and guess what? Forgot it. <laughs> Out it goes. Uh, this was done by Carl Potts, John Bogdanov, and Hilary Barda. 
Uh, it says here, Pots Bog Barda 88. It's a good, good cover. This it is, is a very good looking cover. This, this is one that I get signed. I want to put it up on the wall. Oh, nice. Yeah. That, would be, that would be one that I would say yes. Okay. Now, let's move on to some of the random thoughts and random themes brought up here. Um, Rebecca Little Hale's back. I know. Surprise. Uh, uh, honestly, I thought we'd never see her again. Well, it was only just, what, you know, two episodes or two issues ago. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense that she's back. But uh, honestly, it was, that was just kind of a character where it's like, oh, okay, we'll never see her again. Oh, she's she's back. Okay. Well, we, we've got her for this ep- uh, We've got her for this issue and for the next issue. And then she disappears completely. Okay. All right. So, but... One of our complaints that we had last time that she was here is that we just didn't get enough about her. So we got a couple issues where we get to get a little bit more about mm-hmm. her. I still don't think that they flesh out the character enough. She's just kind of a set piece that gets kidnapped yeah. and then they have to rescue. But it, yeah, she's a MacGuffin that's she's a human a being. Yeah. But I, I I still like the character and I think that she starts to grow a little bit more, especially in the second issue. And we can talk more about that there. I like the fact that they've introduced, you know, a new mutant who's like an eight year old, you know, cute nice girl who doesn't have a devastating power who's you know it's like she's a mutant and there's an argument on her lawn where it's just like you know people are like get out of our neighborhood you kind of don't belong here and other people are like what are you talking about she's just this girl yeah she, you know, uh, of course she belongs here she lives here and even the kids at school talking about it where it's like she's a mutant but she's looks like us you know yeah. it's the you know school kids talking about it. it's like she looks like us i don't know you know, it's like there's some mutants that are, seem really bad and like pestilence touched our friend and he's still sick. And, you know, my grandma's, you know, apartment got destroyed by Apocalypse's ship. But, you know, other mutants saved us. And, right. yeah, it's kind of neat to see that because, they, they, you know, instead of just going, oh, look at this monstrous crab man with laser beam eyes. It's it's no, it's this, it's an eight year old girl or something. It, it's still using the mutant as the metaphor type yeah. of a thing. And, and they're they're really playing around with that a lot in this of saying, you know, here's what mutants are. You know, put in whatever other political thing mm-hmm. you want to mm-hmm. have here and then ask the question is like we don't want this kind here yeah and no we do want this kind here and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about a couple of thoughts i have about that during the uh literary section but th- there is definitely that politics that are playing oh, out here big time. yeah and you know comics aren't political comics have always been political they always have yeah <laughs> It's nice to see that you know we always like that interaction with the school and and with the kids talking about these real life things that are that are affecting them. And you see mm-hmm. other kids talking about it as well with them, and the kids are definitely worried about Rebecca. They help save her one time. They want to make sure she's okay. She's in the spotlight because of what happened on that talk show. Yeah. And they're, they're they're still you know bringing that out. Here's a little kid who's got these powers and they know where she lives and they're going to have this entire political talk right there on their lawn. Yes, and but here's the aspect of it too. They would not have been there if Carmody hadn't been warning them away. That's true too. They wouldn't have been there. They'd have been like, "Hey, it's Rebecca. Okay, don't say her name in front of mom because she'll be like, how do you know her?'" And we'll be like, "We saved her." Yeah, from teleporting. But so Carmody kind of was his quasi his own undoing with this because he uh, could have just been going out doing his own thing except no, I, th- I think he 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 was i believe personally him. he was baiting them into this okay i could see that's that the way i see it i mean he he was saying you know don't show up or you know you're gonna have trouble and he's like all right well we're yeah. gonna make this happen then you better and, not show up over at this address at right. this time on this day or pretty else much, pretty much something and bad he yeah. already had a plan in, to get her and he already had plans in place to make sure he could get away from power pack and he's putting them in another position where they could be seen yeah and he's you know causing them to get more and more into trouble Mm -hmm. and he then you know falls through on his promise that he's going to get them in trouble by showing all these pictures yeah so he could have been he could have been a lot more effective on that (laughs) but you know you know what though it's it's still yeah it's still i mean it still is nearly effective Mm mm-hmm I think that it's all playing into his little bit of a master plan. Mm-hmm. And I think the only reason that he gets undone is because he doesn't take out who our guest stars are the next issue. Yeah. But we'll get to that as well. Boogeyman's got some backing now. Yes, he does. The yes, right. The right. Do you remember the right at all? You know, I absolutely had no recollection of who they were. But then last night I uh, wikied it and uh-huh. I'm like, oh, it's the smiley face armor guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I first started collecting comics, the first comic I did collect was X Factor. Okay. And I started right around issue number 21 when they were really introducing the right and the smiley faces, as mm-hmm. they were called, because they had this big, bulky robotic ar- armor that is just really big and bulky, and they got these weird smiley faces on it. And the right, their entire thing is that they believe that 
it should just be humans only world yes. and that all mutants should be destroyed constantly create division between mutants and humankind humankind must destroy the mutant yeah and you know, purge the heretic uh, right. kill mutant yeah and it's all run by cameron hodge who, mm-hmm. like we said is former friends of the of angel warren worthington the third and he is a bad bad guy and they've mm-hmm. used him so amazingly mm-hmm. uh, uh, continuously yeah and, and he continually comes back yeah so I like the fact that it's a nice, it, it's once again Louise Simonson seeding something in another book, which was X Factor. Mm-hmm. She created the right there, and then bringing that into this book. So she's making the universe more lived in. I like it uh, when you have the kind of the tie-in mentions yeah. and nods because it, it, you know it's just like, well, my armor is made by the right. You've never yeah. heard of them except for this one time in this one comic. Over yeah. in this other issue, you will notice that there's something kind of similar, but they're called the agenda. And that's not even here because Louise Simonson, she's not only has introduced the right in X Factor, but she's also introduced them in New Mutants as well. Yes. So it's something that she has brought over into all of the books that she's got and then few further on they are used by a lot of other writers Mm -hmm. because i know that x-men used the character a lot in going through inferno and leading up through inferno and then in genosha he's part of part of that organization Mm -hmm. as well yeah they've used cameron hodge on the right a lot Mm -hmm. on the whole i do like this story i like this two-parter i like well it's a two-parter story with this and the next one but it also picks up with the earlier rebecca hale story and it's something that they've they've really been seeding a lot with just how the comics have been running so no i really like it a lot because it ties into the power pack lore of stuff with their family stuff at school Mm -hmm. stuff with you know their history carmody yeah the previous issues you know the larger world in the whole it's it's got it's nice it's a good issue with that let's go ahead and talk about the library card and finding the literature in this comic book i am not gonna lie i was having a hard time with this so i started going through the book and you know, reading through again seeing if i could find something i could tie on to anything else and then i noticed something on page three of this book we're looking around the house while the kids are eating breakfast and there's a book that's on a shelf though actually there's lots of books everywhere but you can't really see any words that are on them a couple of them like are a b c d and things like that but there's one book that actually has a title on it and it's secret voodoo spell yeah, I saw it, too. Yeah. I'm like, hmm, that stands out. Yeah, that stands out. I tried looking for it. I, I couldn't find anything like that. But while I was looking, I kind of thought of something. Now, bear with me here. At the same time I was working on this script in, like, this last weekend or so, I, I've been doing my own little pet project. I have a small stack of old VHS tapes that I've been trying to convert over to more modern media, permanent media, I should say. And, and I finally had the, the, the right equipment to do it, and I finally had just a little bit of time where I was going to get it done, and a couple other reasons as well. So I started to record over these old VHS tapes, and most of them are recordings of plays I was in in high school, because I was in theater. One of those plays was The Crucible, and I played a role in that play. Knowing the same, when I saw that book in the comic and I thought about this play, I made a really weird connection to The Crucible. The Crucible is a 1953 play by Arthur Miller. It's a partially fictionalized account about the Salem witch trials and an allegory on the MacArthurism that was occurring at the time. In 1692, the Salem witch trials broke out after several girls claimed to be targeted by a devilish hand. And after several months, over 150 men, women, and children were charged with witchcraft and sorcery. Now, the reason I made the connection deals with one of the characters in the story. Tituba, who is based on a real historical figure, was the first woman accused of being a witch. She was a slave owned by Samuel Paris of Danvers, Massachusetts. She was accused of using voodoo and witchcraft and teaching the other girls. It's interesting to note that because she confessed to witchcraft and named names, she was never executed for being a witch. In fact, she was eventually freed after the witch trials, after someone else paid for her jail fines. The hysteria surrounding these witch trials were all based upon specific accusations made by Betty and her cousin Abigail Williams, and this caused the direct deaths of 20 Salem residents, 19 of which were hanged while another, Giles Corey, was pressed to death. Another connection that could be made is the hysteria and protests that occurred in front of the Little Hale House. People using religion to condemn people who are different or do not fit into what is deemed normal in society. 
Now, during the Puritan times in Salem, there was a definite template about what was acceptable and palatable for the community, and it just took a group of people who knew how to work that system and how to use it as a power to destroy those who just wanted to live. So I, I just, as I kind of went down my own little rabbit hole with putting these together, I started to realize there's actually some more connections that you could say, even though <laughs> the Crucible wasn't pulled out. I made my own little connection with this <laughs> book of voodoo spells into something I was doing to think about how you could really look at those things together. And like we talked about earlier, just the fact that you've got these people who are protesting saying, you know, get out of here. You're not normal. You're not like us and other people protesting. Well, they just want to be like, uh, you know, they just want to be normal. They just want to live their lives. You had that kind of hysteria a few times in our American history. You know, you could look back to McCarthyism and, and uh, the communist uh, trials mm -hmm. back in the 50s. You could look back to the Salem witch trials. You know, those are the real witch trials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I found it to be kind of an interesting little connection that I made. It's really hard to determine whether or not somebody is actually a witch. And one way you cannot do it at all is through any kind of scientific method. It's true. There's no uh, litmus test no, for there, witch There is none at all. Yeah. But be that as it may, can you turn a little voodoo spell on us with your witchcraft that we call science? I like that voodoo that you, you do, do science so well. well. <laughs> <laughs> In this issue, our young heroes were chasing down the boogeyman in an attempt to rescue Rebecca Littlehale. In a successful bid to escape, he flew higher and higher, taunting the powers with the information that the higher that they went, the harder it would be for them to breathe without mechanical augmentation. Eventually, the pack had to give up as they grasped their necks and said that they couldn't breathe. So, I wondered to myself, why is this? Well, this is why. When we climb to higher altitudes and the atmospheric pressure goes down, our ability to force the oxygen into our bloodstream correspondingly goes down. If we climb too high, not enough oxygen will make it into our bloodstreams, resulting in wooziness, unconsciousness, and eventually death. This is because our lungs contain millions of tiny sacs called alveoli, which are essentially tiny membranes that allow oxygen to come in and dissolve in the hemoglobin of our blood. The bloodstream in turn carries the dissolved oxygen molecules throughout the body. The gas to blood transfer, however, requires a lot of air pressure. We need a blood oxygen level of between 87% and 97% to maintain consciousness by maintaining the oxygen to hemoglobin flow. At 10,000 feet above sea level, the normal saturation for a human breathing regular air is 87%. Go to 18,000 feet without supplemental oxygen, and the saturation drops to 80%. That means we're going to start getting woozy and hypoxic. And unless we've added substantial hemoglobin to our bloodstreams by living at very high altitudes, will eventually black out. There is an altitude range, however, where even breathing 100% oxygen won't provide enough life-sustaining oxygen saturation in the bloodstream. That point is around 28,000 to 30,000 feet. Above that, there isn't enough oxygen pressure, even when breathing pure oxygen, to shove the O2 molecules across the membranes and into the hemoglobin. Carmody probably had a pressure-breathing oxygen mask in his suit that would allow him to breathe and maintain consciousness up to 50,000 feet, which is about 30,000 feet higher than the powers could chase him. So that is why he got away, because he used his superpower to breathe while high. And that's Science Corner. <laughs> Always got to end on a dad joke, don't I? <laughs> dad jokes. Dad jokes. Dad jokes. <laughs> Well, as fathers, we tend to not only make bad jokes, but we also tend to take a lot of artwork that our children do and mm -hmm. put it up on the refrigerator. Yeah. Well, let's take some artwork that Mr. Salvaluto did and uh, put that up on the family refrigerator, shall we? Yes, let's shall. I like his artwork. Yeah, it, it's very crisp. It's clean. It looks nice. The uh, characters look a little bit different than what uh, I'm used to. But at the same time, it, it, they're recognizable as to who they are. I still think they do a good job with it. I mean, he's got some great uh, action features on their faces. There's a lot of good emoting on all the characters. There is a huge amount of emoting. Yeah. And he does uh, he does a lot of good different kind of like just explosions and action and moving. And you, you can tell what's happening in yeah. this. It's good backgrounds. Really good backgrounds, too. Yeah, he doesn't leave uh, very many just blank no. blank backgrounds. There's always almost something going on. So let's talk about the ha 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 funny ones, shall we? Mm-hmm. What do you have for your backup, sir? My joke backup one is on page 15, and I call it, Ah, low wall, so we meet again. <laughs> and this is the bottom center panel, and uh, I like <laughs> to think that in Alex's rogue gallery, low walls are one of his nemesises. 
Because <laughs> well, you know, he doesn't have any flying power. He None doesn't of, have the D grab power. No, nope. he he's the most pedestrian of all three. He, he super is. I mean, he could disintegrate his way through, but they're trying to keep a low profile. Yeah. So what's going what's going on in this is that there is a quasi low wall that they need to get over to get into where the action is, and they just and and they landed back behind this wall so that they could costumes off exactly without right. drawing anybody's attention. And Jack is just kind of you know D grab nimbled his way up the wall and he's like yeah that's great and alex is like hey a little help here as he's kind of struggling he's, and kicking over he's, garbage cans it was like, yeah he used a garbage can which then ran off two cats yeah <laughs> one of which is a mutant cat how do you say that it's blue <laughs> oh it's just in shadows <laughs> it's a mutant cat it's okay, a blue mutant fine cat. we'll just say it's a mutant cat but yeah it, it's it's just funny also because alex is like hey have a have a hand and jack's all you're the one who said we had to maintain secret identities <laughs> so nope move on up here <laughs> i want to go a few pages prior to that on page 11 i chose one of your kinds yeah and i i call this i'll make you talk kid <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's my that's my number one joke. Okay, and, what would you call it? Yeah, I called it. Uh, Oops, did I do that? <laughs> and so this is this is the, uh, the the reporter accidentally bumping into Rebecca. Yeah, and it's just a smack and a bump, and it's just it's a walk up punch. Yeah, it's like you know the glasses are falling down. They it, actually it's, break. A lens pops out. Yeah, the lens pops out. It's just it's it's pretty vicious. It is horrible. In fact, you know, it's just like the mom is all like, "Officer, are you gonna let this lady assault my kid?" And and the the reporter lady is all like. I was just standing here. He bumped me. I should press charges. It's like, lady, you need a throat punch. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. a monster. Well, that's okay. I think that she passes out from the explosion or gets knocked out from the explosion. She gets dragged out of there at one uh, point. I don't know. I stopped paying attention to her out of hate. <laughs> Since that was your top one, I'll go yeah. to my top one, which is on page eight. This is a good one. I call this one Julian Jack. <laughs> and there's a lot to choose from here, but yeah. I, I think I'm going to go for the top one because the top one, we also have Katie in here as yeah, well. which is great. You know, in the foreground, we got the two unnamed girls. You got Alex carrying Allison's books and in the background you see julie handing over her bag to jack and yeah. jack is accepting it very proper like and down below you got kitty making the like strangling yeah. ah, <laughs> you know, motion as they are just mocking <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a great one. Yeah, I like it, this one a lot too. It's it is is such the uh, these are my siblings. I hate yeah. them. I hate them yep. so much. And I really just enjoy Julie and Jack. Julie and Jack are really a great combo yeah, team. Are, yeah, they're they a great team. Well, go ahead and do your uh, backup top art one, please. My backup top one is on page twenty three, and I call it Smoke Jumper. Okay. Yeah, it's in the upper right hand corner, and it is uh, the boogeyman holding the um, you know the bagged up doggy and little girl. And Julie is uh, clouding around him to try and confuse him. But there's just this cool, you know, she's like kind of read around him. And the areas that she's covered over, it's, you know, distorted the image in the background. So it's like, yeah, that's really pretty cool. I like that a lot. No, that's that's a very cool one. It's, mm -hmm. it's And Carmody's flying in the air. So it looks like he's kind of going through smoke. It's just, I just thought that looked really nice. And there's a lot of, I like the shadows of, of the inside of the bag as yeah. Rebecca's in there. There's there's a lot of good composition to that one. Yeah, I the, do like that one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. That one just kept on drawing me. There's a lot of nice art in this, but I was there's like. There's a lot. Yeah. I was having a hard time i'm choosing which one i wanted well, once again i'm gonna ask you to go a couple pages forward and i'm gonna call this one on page 21 good catch this is the top panel and this is right after carmody has done the flashing lights and rebecca has teleported in the middle of the air and she's fallen and he swings by and catches her and skippy in the bag and so you see like you know rebecca falling and they go into the bag and he's got the he's coming swinging down and you see the burning house in the background it's just a very cool and composed shot no, it's really great, and you get the uh, the uh, the flare effect on his on the on his big bright lights that he has on his shoulders, and yeah, you get to see the neighborhood and cars and the smoke. Yeah, it's a good perspective shot. It's a good silhouette shot. It's everything about that is really pretty cool. Yeah, there's there's just a lot to that one. It's, I really like his art. He does some good stuff. What do you got? My top one is on page sixteen, and I call it. I make this look easy. <laughs> and it is in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, and it is uh, Katie flying up to go rescue somebody that Julie had pointed out to her. But uh, Jack's already there, and he's picking up a like a Bronco, you know, uh, like a, a big four by four truck, and he's just picking it up and moving it out of the way, you know, just nonchalant, like, yeah, I'll just pick this car up and get it out of the way so it don't explode. And I just, I love just you seeing a little boy, and he's just picking up a car, and he's like, yeah, I'm just moving this, and there's a victim, and there's fire, and there's flying. It's cool, nice, yeah, nice. I like this one a lot. Again, there's a lot 
lot of good art. There's a lot of good art in this one. And I'm going to go to one, another one that I thought you would pick, and it's on page 13, mm-hmm. and it is called the Firebomb. Oh, yeah. This was this is a good one. This is this is kind of the big set piece one here. This is as the Firebomb goes off. There's all the people in the front yard, and you know, right in the center, you've got the house. Boom, and the explosion's coming right from the center of the house in the kind of in the attic area so like you know the top of the house is kind of exploding out there is stuff blowing out from the house yeah windows and bookcases and all sorts of stuff you've got like seven or eight people that are kind of caught in this and they're all flying backwards there's one guy who looks like he took a brick to the head he's like almost bent over backwards yeah Uh, fireballs coming out three dimensions and boom right in the center it is just action and terror and everything in there it is very impressive. Yeah, and it has the interesting lighting because everything's illuminated by the explosion. That's yeah, it's got a lot going on. It's got that two tone lighting that you like. Yeah. yeah. No, it's this again. It was on my list. Yeah. And uh, I'm just looking at it right now. I can think of a couple of different uh, titles for it, which include "The Roof Is on Fire." The roof. The yep. roof. The roof is on fire. Yeah. And to keep in the musical the- theory of that, I would also go. Here comes the boom. <laughs> or ooh, you could do guile noise. Sonic boom! Sonic boom! Yeah, so there's a lot of things that you could say on this. There's, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of words you can use to describe this. Yeah, and uh, some of those words could be hurtful. Yeah, they could be hurtful. We could say horrible things about this, like uh, your house is so uh, so horrible that it blew up. You could also say horrible words like. You little brats are fools. You little brats are fools. Why do I saying, have to have dopey brats as my siblings? Yep, there's a I, lot I'm, of dopey I, words I, there. I, I mean, I'm just saying that because on page 23, mm-hmm. on page 23, we have Carmody saying, you little brats are fools. Yes. I mean, he's not only insulting them, but he's also degrading them with that insult. Yes, he is. He's uh, <laughs> he, he has upped his uh, insult game to get on a uh, school children's yes. level. <laughs> Yes. yes. Uh, He's because, like, I've because, been needing to work this out. You're, you're right. I should. Your brats are fools. Yeah, get your. Uh, get, get my your, jowl game yeah, going on. Yeah. Get, get your future Alma Nixon in there. So that was my backup one. What is your backup one? My backup one is on page seven, and it's an Alex one. Wow. I know. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) So this is right after uh, Jack informs Alex that the wonderful and perfect and oh so uh, amazing Allison McCourt is uh, there on the street in front of him. And Alex's response to that is, oh, why don't you just shrivel up and blow away? Yep. So that's what he tells (laughs) to his younger brother, Jack. And I just thought, just shrivel up and blow away i'm like yeah that's a good little one that's a great one i mean they've got a lot of you know jerks and brats and uh-huh. you know creepy whatever and gloppy and stuff but it's just kind of like so shrivel up and blow away i'm like yeah that's, yep, that's a yep, good kid that's, a good, that's, that's pretty a good, great good kid one there. Yep. Good. and to follow up on that scene mm-hmm. from my top one on page eight we'll just go ahead and say hmm dopey brats why do i have to have dopey brats for relatives <laughs> <laughs> Double hit the dopey brats. Double, double hit, hit the dopey double brats. Double hit the dopey brats. Uh, I do like the fact that you get a little bit of information about Allison's home life in this, too, because she says that, uh, I just wish I had brothers and sisters. I'd even settle for dopey ones. So right. it's like, oh, she's a, she's a single kid. Uh, what's your top one? My top one is on page eight. And it is the uh, it's the discourse between Jack and Julie when they're uh, to- tormenting uh, Alex, <laughs> and I just absolutely love that. You know, we've already done it, but uh, you know, it's just you know, Julie passing you know her book bag over to a very posturing Jack, and Jack's all, "I say, beautiful one, may I have the honor of carrying these incredible books?" So basically, the insult that you're the the insult that you're doing is the mocking yeah, the mocking. joking <laughs> they put a lot of work into this one and they freeformed it so well it's great oh thank you my lord yep. i wouldn't want to injure my perfect arms <laughs> oh <laughs> it's nothing <laughs> yeah just and just you just see it's the image that goes with it too because julie's all hands clasped and just oh so you know head leaned back and just oh my my savior oh <laughs> my goodness and and jack's all you know, making it seem like the books are just the biggest burden and yeah what dopey brats <laughs> oh what dopey brats yeah it just ties all up it ties into itself in a beautiful bow and i i love all of it well since we're talking about this you know ang tension between the kids let's talk about which kid is the best and which kid is the worst all right and as always we start with the worst kid and i will go first and i will say that the worst kid was alex really 
really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's basically because he kind of Alexed a lot in this. You know, he he taunted Katie with disintegrating his oatmeal instead of mm. eating it. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of food waste and the aspect too, or you know, it's like. Uh, He's all, ah, my brothers and siblings are stupid brats. But that, you know, that's very yeah. little. But it's just the aspect, too, where it's, it's kind of like, no, the voice on the phone said stay away. We don't, we should not go there. And also, uh, I want to hang out with uh, my girlfriend instead of going and maybe saving this other innocent person. And then he didn't really do a lot in, yeah. in you know, in the rescue. You know, he kind of like had a trouble getting over a wall. And also, here's a giant thing. I mean, the kid was hanging out on a windowsill outside of his uh, bedroom <laughs> and that's not cool man that's not safe I can't reward a child who has you know, endangered himself and his siblings by just hanging out a window loosey goosey it's just ridiculous he, he needs to be grounded especially since you know he, he has no flight power at all yeah there's that there's that yeah <laughs> Amazingly, I didn't go for Alex this time. I went with Katie. Okay, I could I, see I could see that, but uh, she she was really argumentative. She yeah. was really whiny, especially at the beginning, because like Alex, you want you to yeah. disintegrate. It's like she, she was dumped doing all her, that. She dumped her porridge. She dumped her porridge. Uh, she was really rushing into things during mm-hmm. everything too. She say, she pulled a lot of people. There was a lot of people just hanging around a burning building instead of walking there, away. There, but she pulled a lot of people out. She was helping people yeah. out, and I mean, all the kids were helping. I mean, the only one who kind of wasn't was Julie because she's have a power like well she actually but, was too because she was she, she, she became a spotter she, she was, was like, a okay, spotter she was i'm gonna spotter. i can go into the fire right. and the smoke and i can identify where people so, are you know katie one over there right. hey over there so she was she, she was she was being a, a 911 caller right, she was yeah. dispatched she, it, all the kids were doing the saving i just found I that, that she was just she was rushing into some things and, and yeah, yeah I, I had some issues with katie. there were problems with yeah. everybody there really were and and so i totally get that we think that that some of the kids were really good yes we do who do you have the best i thought jack was the best i did too the easy peasy yep. that's yeah the worst thing he did when well, i'm gonna uh, approve of this he was hanging outside of his bedroom window and just experiencing life being a tightrope walker and stuff and i approve of that i approve of young children <laughs> hanging outside their window so i gotta if, applaud him for that and give him the best powers that if they have not power, keep yeah, that, yeah just keep him from falling, falling to their death exactly yeah. yeah not in real life come on it's a comic guy so yeah he, he broke up the fight yes he did he was really funny with julie he I, was really I, funny I, with I, julie. Did, I had to give a lot to that one i mean yeah. i was like yes he was being a dopey little brat brother but i mean it was that fun type it of, was and, pretty it was, great it was a yeah. really good one it's like you know we're, we're making fun of you but deal with it <laughs> yeah, deal with it because this is great material here he also ate his oatmeal he also he did a lot of things everything he, anytime they showed him he was on point yeah he really was it was his idea to go to rebecca's place it was his idea to hide their costume it's his it was him saying why don't we have masks it, yeah, yeah. everything he was doing was like boom he, we got to do this boom he, we yes, got to do he this was, he was using his degraph power in front of allison on, yeah. on alex yeah but it was doing it in such a way that you couldn't tell. Yeah, you couldn't tell. He just... Good job, Jack. Yeah, way to go, Jack. Speaking of Jack and his coolness, mm-hmm. let's talk about Alex and not his coolness and G-Power. Yeah, let's talk about zero G. G-Power is where we find the scientific uh, G-Force equivalent of how many Gs were dropped by Alex in the issue. He dropped zero. You could find that if you were Rebecca Little Hale teleporting into the sky and falling into a Mylar bag. So there's zero G. Our G average is 0.79 and that is 0.1 g's off of the surface gravity of uranus which is again the seventh planet from the sun and not what you were thinking (laughs) and that gives us a maintained g total of 31 which is three graphs higher than the surface gravity of our sun all right all right there we go rank this thing we have an Mm -hmm. ever-growing list as i like to steal from battle of the atom with the number one being end of the snark wars which is uh, Power Pack 25 Power Trip and of course our last place we still have X Factor Annual number 2 mm-hmm. so uh, I'm actually thinking that this is going to be a bit on the upper end of yeah. the scale yeah. probably start in the middle and work our way up kind of yeah, thing yeah I'm, I'm, I'm Heck, looking at possibly even go to the quarter and work your way around there mm-hmm. I'm looking at let's start with 15 okay. which is When we- You Wish Upon a Star mm-hmm. Power Pack number 24 that's uh, where, where they're up on Snark World and Caves by the Dweller Actually, here we go. Uh, Power Pack 22. That's where the kids go sledding and Alex and Johnny get rival get in a fight. But we got that one. It's kind of comparable kinda around comparable that. Kind of comparable because it's very much a, it's a regular life story. I yeah. mean, yes, near the end of this, they are fighting Carmody. But I mean, all the rest of the interactions they have are really mundane-ish yeah. things. I mean, yeah. yes, they're saving people from a fire, but. But they're doing it in uh, in their streetwear. Yes. Their civilian IDs. And yeah, just pulling people away from the explosion mm-hmm. and the fire and stuff. So, so I, I guess, let's say, do we like this more or less than Trapped. 
Hmm. Trapped had Franklin in it, and he's adorable. So <laughs> uh, I might like Trapped a little bit better, I'm thinking. Okay. All right. Your opinion? I can go with that. I can go with that. I, I think it would either be above or below this one. because It's still, really, yeah, it is really the, close. Above this, we have the 12th, which was Power Pack 36, which I think is a far superior issue to this. Mm -hmm. Below that, we have the one I was started talking about with uh, When You Wish Upon a Star. That's, uh, that's part of the Snark World thing, yep. which is a great issue. Oh, yeah. Part of a series there. I, I think I could probably put this above that. Okay. Let's uh, replace number 15 with this then. All right. Which will push uh, When You Wish Upon a Star down a slot into slot 16. Brand new 15 is a brand new Carmody. Very good showing. All right. So let's talk about the final thoughts on our beer. What do we think of this, which of course is cult classic pale ale, the nod to the Portland area institution, Movie Madness, which if you do come to Portland, please check it out. It's worth the trip. What do we think of this beer? It's really quite nice, actually. It is an IPA, but it is super mild. It's <laughs> really kind of great. Um, I'm not getting the bitterness. No, it's not bitter at all. It's got a nice mellow taste. Uh, it's a good summer beer, I would yeah. say. As it warms up, the front end sweetness decreases a little bit, but so does that kind of like dusty must mm -hmm. flavor at the end that I got. It's still there. Both are still there. Yeah, it's just, it's real mild. It has yeah. flavor. Even the aftertaste is it's kind of nice. It's just like, yeah, I had that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah it, I've it's, been enjoying it's, this one. It's very, it's a mellow beer. It's yeah. pretty chill, which is kind of nice. I'm going to go ahead and give it the four. Really? Okay. I could, yeah, I, I will go four too. Uh, initial instinct was go four. And then I was like, well, maybe three and a half. No, no, like, I recognize that I don't like IPAs. Yeah. And I'm enjoying this enough that I would say that this is a four IPA. Yeah. So. For us. Yeah, for Because us. everybody's got their different opinions and different yeah. flavors and what they like and what they don't like. So, But our opinion is right because it's our show. Yeah, there you go. And since it's our show, we are going to talk to Rick's daughter about the issue at hand that we've just discussed. So, Rick and Carrie, talk to us for a while. We like it when you do. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Dad. How you doing tonight? Good. Excellent. Are you ready to tackle a new book? Of course. I can't do it without you. Aw, shucks. We've got a new book here, and this book features some old friends, right? Yeah. Who is in it? Rebecca. Right. And that's the littlest mutant, right? Yeah. Who else is in it? Carmody. Yeah. The boogeyman's back, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I thought that bag looked familiar. <laughs> What did you think about this one? I mean, what happened in this one? Becca's house caught on fire, and when she went to get her dog, Power Pack saved her dog, her and her dog. But then she saw the light of Carm of the Boogeyman, and so she um, teleported up to him, and he trapped her. And she got what? Kidnapped. And her dog got wolf napped. <laughs> That's cute. That's cute. I like it. So what did you, uh, what was your overall feelings about this book? Did, was it interesting? Was it good? Was it kind of exciting? It was interesting. Why do you say that? I think there was a lot of action when the house caught on fire. Mm-hmm. And also when that reporter lady broke the glasses. Yeah, there were some not nice people there, weren't there? Yeah. There's a lot of talk about people didn't want Rebecca and her family there, right? No. Should people act like that way to each other? No. That's right. What did you think about that cover? It's cool. I like it. Yeah, it's got a. It's very action packed. It's. Yeah. It shows you that there's a bad guy that's attacking them, and you can kind of see Rebecca and her dog in there a little bit too. Can't I know. You can, at first I didn't notice. I thought it was just a bag, but when I read some like halfway of it, I looked in there. I could see a face, and I can see a little dog face. It's just like innocent faced. <laughs> oh, innocent faced. As if there was not of Rebecca's house to not catch on fire. It was. It's not being kicked. Wolf napped by uh, the boogeyman right now. Mm -hmm. She's acting all like, this is a normal day. <laughs> a normal week. So all in all, it sounds like you really like this book, right? Yeah. Did you have any questions about it at all? No. We left off with them being kidnapped and the kids are in trouble again, right? Yeah. Because Carmody's trying to expose them, right? Yeah. It's a good thing Alex disintegrated the rest of the photos. That's true. What do you think is going to happen next issue? Carmody's going to try again. They're going to have to avoid um, Carmody telling their parents next issue, and he might try again. He's going to try again. But what else are they going to have to do? They're going to have to rescue somebody, right? Rebecca and her dog. That's woof, right. Woof. <laughs> all right. That's all the questions I have for you. I love you, honey. Love you, too. Woof, woof. Hey, hey, they talked to us. So now that they've talked to us, let's go to shout out time, which Rick likes to do. I was just going to say, that's the point that we 
talk about the recognitions from those listeners who go on and like us on social media or somehow give us some kind of, well, notification that they like us. Yeah, we, uh, we're we simple that way. We like it. We like our pats on the head. We are simple. Yeah. We're going to be doing the shout outs for episode 48. And that's where we covered Power Pack number 37, Seeing the Light, the first time that we actually met Rebecca Littlehale, which is very nice. Al Sedano and the Resurrections, an Adam Warlock and Thanos podcast. Blast it or stash it. Bradley Austin Knoll. CH0. Charlie Rose. Chuck Gears. The sore loser himself, David Collins. <laughs> Dude, you just gotta just keep pushing him till he breaks, don't, aren't you? Pretty much. Fan Film Fridays podcast. Gene Hendricks. Georgie Romero is done for. Jerome. Unemployed nerf herder. Gibson Gray. Green Lantern HG. Hal Jordan. Hoover Jeremiah. Jeff Polier. Jeremy Daw. The Long Box Crusade. Featuring Pat DJ Cristato Sampson. The Mal DeLorean. Max Traver. Mr. Roger Core. Rustin LF. Ruth Sutherland. Sean Ross and the Secret Wars and Beyond podcast. Come on down, Tim Price, the Podcrasher. Waffles. Colin Stapleton and the worst comic podcast ever. We also got a five star review from Maxwell Chris on Apple Podcast, and he said. Pac-Man and Pac-Daughter leading the pack. This show has it all. 1980s comic books, beer, science, refrigerator art, G-forces, and commentary from an actual target age child. She steals the show every time, of course. The creators of Power Pack have been guests too. Tune in or be less energized than you could be. Thank you very much. That is a very, very kind little comment there. Yeah, thank you so very much. We, we really do... Uh, yeah, it's like every once in a while I go kind of hunting. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, let's look up us. And I'm like, ah, see if anybody's dropped a review. And this one popped a couple of days ago. And I'm like, hey, hey, hey. And it's, I texted Rick immediately. And he really, was like, hey. It really is nice to get those. So yeah. be sure to check out our other shows that we're on. Our junior agent submissions on the MI6 Rookie Agents episodes of On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for unpacking the power of power pack jeff and rick present is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live box of audio equipment in portland oregon if you would like to interact with us through the magic of the internet you can do so through twitter at jeff and rick present our facebook page jeff and rick present our email address jeff and rick present all one word at gmail.com or at our website jeff and rick present dot wordpress dot com also, we have a YouTube channel at Jeff and Rick Present. And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word. We are a supporter of the Hero Initiative and will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us, and we will read off that review on our show. Just go to wherever you listen to our podcast and review us. Tell your friends about us, and, you know, <laughs> shout our names from the rooftop. No, don't do that. You might get taken away. Yes. So, in the dead of night, walk down streets and just yell it into people's apartment windows. 12 o'clock, and you should be listening to Jeff and Rick Presents, and all is well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Throw a brick through an apartment store window, and when the alarms bring people outside to see what's going on, go, you should listen to Jeff and Rick. Also, I wasn't here when this brick was thrown. <laughs> Don't do that. That's Don't do that. Don't, Don't do that, that, that at all. all. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs, my wife Cindy and our daughter Carrie. My fiance Hillary and our daughter Aurora. We, we love, love you. you. Until next time. Costumes, costumes off. Our theme music is 80s action. Also featured in this episode is Scattershot. All music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Also, what's that from? Just it's a bad joke. Okay, yes, it is. It's I a, agree. It's from a bad joke. Okay. Yep, yep. Then the unnamed friends start to exposition. Then, then Jeff starts to not read words. Yep, yep. As the kids run off to class, Jack and Julie state that they are still worried. Working, worried. Words. <clears throat> w. Vindo. Vindo. Worried. Oh no! One of the reporters has just totally super accidentally gently charged up and bumped slash punched into Rebecca's face. Wow.
And now we know that this very, very familiar villain wants to... Do it again and say familiar-looking villain. There we go. That'll help. <laughs> we'll see. Yep, yep. That's right. Their dad's old boss who tried kidnapping the kids. Yep, yep. Anybody. Anybody, really, who has the money. Just, mm. who, they think I'm going to sell to him. <laughs> I'm going to sell to whoever. <laughs> I think that's what Spoiler. Carnage sounds like. Demons. What? <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. In this issue, our young heroes were chasing down the boogeyman. 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 Yep, yep. And with that, let's talk about our final thought. Let's track of blub, 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 blub. <coughs> And with that, <sighs> let's blubber our words around until we get to the part of the script where we can see what's going on. <laughs> 